Bob, here we are in at your, last. at last, at last, in your hometown of Toronto. We're mm -hmm. just outside of Toronto. I believe you moved to Toronto when you were 10 years old. It was actually on your 10th birthday. That's right. What would 10 year old Bob think of all of this, of the life that you've created? He would probably think it was a fantasy. <laughs> yeah. And it really is in a way, because that's where it starts. Yeah. It starts as a fantasy, you know? Oh yeah, it's such, such an enormous change from the lifestyle that I came from, yeah. There are even things that are in existence now that weren't in existence when oh, you were yeah. 10. Sure, for sure. Right? Almost everything that we <laughs> are used to using every day. Yeah, you know? it's yeah. so incredible. In fact, it was after I moved to Toronto, mm -hmm. it was right after the Second World War. I moved to Toronto during the war. Uh, it was in 1944. My grandfather came to stay with us. My dad had been in Europe in the war. And he, he brought my grandfather to stay with us for a while. And my grandfather saw an ad in a magazine for a ballpoint pen. That was the first ballpoint pen I ever saw. There were none. You, it, you, uh, you had to load your pen with ink, and they were always leaking. Or you had an ink well on your desk or, yeah. I know that sounds like a thousand years ago, but that's, that's the way it was. That's Every time I see a ballpoint pen, I think, hey, I'm, and it skipped all over the place. You'd write and you'd miss, write and miss, you know, it didn't have a good flow to it. It certainly changed it. Certainly changed it, and mm -hmm. so many things have changed. Bob, I think of you as a 20-something-year-old with your job at the fire station. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. I mean, if we're being honest, it's kind of a miracle you even got that good of a job oh. at the fire station, right? Well, I'll tell you, they, uh, they probably had two or 3,000 applications. Mm -hmm. um, you had to weigh 160 pounds. I weighed 135 pounds. You had to have high school education. I had two months high school education. You know, they say it pays to know somebody. I didn't even know this man. The magistrate, Magistrate Lynn, lived two doors up from my mother. And I thought, I wonder. And I saw the ad in the paper, and I went and asked him. I said I was going to put in an, an application for the fire department, and uh, I was wondering if there was anything he could do to help me. I think he was flattered that I asked him. He said, well, come on in, son. He took me in the living room, and he sat down. And he got on the phone and phoned Bill Allen, who was the Reeve, or the mayor, of East York, where I was. Like that, I was on the fire department. So they were hiring about 21 people. I was one of them. Yeah. Strange. I mean, you must have felt like you won the lottery in oh, a way. No question. Getting that. Well, I'll tell you, I was working in a service station, pumping gas and changing oil for a dollar an hour. I'd work um, six days a week. And once a month, I'd work seven. So I was earning $48 a week. And I went on the fire department. I was working... Um, seven days and seven nights a month because there was only two shifts and I started out at a hundred dollars so I doubled my pay and I cut my hours almost in half and so there you are and there's a mishap that happens you're in East Toronto mm. that's where you are and there's like this mishap of a flatbed truck and bricks are everywhere. Mm -hmm. And they call in you and other firefighters to come and pick up these bricks off the road. But I believe the person that owned that company would change the trajectory of your life. That was Ray Stanford. Yeah, that's right. He didn't own the company. He worked there. He worked there. And he didn't, they didn't call the fire department in. He asked me if I wanted to go and do it. And he got a couple other people. And I said, sure. We were, we were always doing side jobs. Yeah. I would never do it again, I'll tell you. Picking up bricks, my back was just about broken when I was finished. But that's how I met Ray, yeah. And Ray saw something in you, Bob. I think Ray saw something in everybody. Um, and I, I think if he liked you, he would help you. I th that's the way I've sort of analyzed it. And he, um, 
he, he suggested, he said, why don't you change the results you're getting? Well, I didn't know I could. Like, I, to the, I never even thought of changing results. I'd wake up and I'd go to work and, yeah. you know. Um, the idea of results and changing results, happiness, health, well, that never entered my mind. But he said, listen, he said, I'm happy, healthy, wealthy. You're unhappy, sick, and broke. He's my way works, yours then. Why don't you do exactly what I tell you? Now, I had never done what anybody told me. I was 26. Um, <laughs> I just would not follow direction. I hated discipline. And for some strange reason, I decided I would do what this man told me. And what he did when he did that, or when, when I decided I would do that, I learned a great secret of life. Mm. Um, here I was, a person who was getting results that I would have only dreamed of. I never thought I could get them. Um, you go to a person that's getting the results you want, ask them what to do, and then do exactly what they tell you. And so I did that with him. And then as I moved on and kept growing and developing, um, I kept doing that. I would go to people that were getting results that I wanted to get, mm -hmm. and I would do what they told me. I mean, we do that with basic things. If you're going to drive a car, you go to somebody who knows how to drive the car, and then you do what they tell you. But that's an unusual practice in life in general. And it's too bad because we can do anything, we can have anything we want. I think it's so remarkable, Bob, that Ray says to you, do exactly what I say. And before mm -hmm. that, you were undisciplined. You already felt like you won the lottery. You were at the fire station. Mm -hmm. So probably by your standards, you were doing pretty good. I was, yeah. Yeah. So what do you think it was that you were like, yeah, I'm going to do it? Well, he gave me this book. I got elastic around it, hold it together. And the book has literally fallen apart now. Yeah. I've been reading this book every day since the day he gave it to me. That was in October 1961. And he said, if you follow what's in this book, is you can have anything you want. Now, I mean, I couldn't believe that, but, you know, he sort of had me, he said, my way's working, yours isn't. And then he said, listen, the man that wrote this book was mentored by the wealthiest man in the world at the time, Andrew Carnegie. He got together with Carnegie in 1908. Carnegie commissioned him to write The Laws of Achievement. Mm -hmm. Hill was a writer, Napoleon Hill. And he introduced him to 500 of the world's most accomplished individuals. So he started to study them all and study their lives. And he found there was a, like a golden thread running through their lives. If you're winning, you're following certain rules. It doesn't matter what you're doing. And he said, you know, he said he spent his whole life writing this book. He started in 1908. It was published in 1937. Now, he said he spent his whole life studying 500. So you've got the composite here of the best thinking from 500 of the world's most accomplished individuals. Like the author, Hill, was, he was an intimate friend with uh, Henry Ford and Thomas Edison, you know, uh, Harvey Firestone. These were giants in their field at that time. And he became very close friends with them. And so he said, he spent his whole life studying and putting this together. He said, I think it would be a very prudent move on your part if you spent the rest of your life trying to understand and apply it. Yeah. And, you know, that's it. He, he said, do exactly what I tell you until you find out I'm lying or I don't know what I'm talking about. I said, I don't lie, and I do know what I'm talking about. It changed everything. It changed everything. Yeah. You named your youngest son after Ray. I did. I did. That's yeah. how much he meant to you. Raymond Douglas Stanford, yeah. Raymond Douglas Proctor, yeah. Were you named after anyone? Just my grandfather, my mother. Ah, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. So this book, Bob, so now you know you're in that material, and you fall in love with it because you've changed your life. This book is a bestseller times you know over and over again and it's interesting because i think some people don't know the backstory of this book i love this you are in a taxi 
in Toronto. Mm -hmm. You've written out with a pen mm -hmm. the manuscript for the book. You come home, Linda's there, you're talking to Linda about it, and you reach, out, reach into your folder to show it to her, but it's not there. Mm -hmm. Linda starts panicking. She is going through the yellow pages, which by the way, if you're too young, that's what we called a phone book. <laughs> she is going through the yellow pages, phoning mm. every taxi company to find this. Mm. But she says, what strikes her is how calm mm. you are. And you say, Linda, I guess that wasn't meant to be the book. There's a better version of that. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, you see, that's part of what I've learned from reading this book. Yeah. When something bad happens, it's not just bad, it's also good. Like, if it's 50 feet from that wall to that wall, it has to be 50 feet from that wall to that wall. They're equal and opposite. It's all governed by law. So when something bad happens, I, uh, I just sort of calm down and think, There's, if this is real bad, it's real good. I had written the whole thing by hand. I didn't type. And paper swells. I had a folder as well, that thick. I didn't have my name on it, nothing. I left it in the back of a taxi. I couldn't tell you the color of the taxi, the name of the taxi, nothing. So, I mean, it was gone. Now, the only difference, I wasn't in Toronto, I was in Atlanta, mm. is where we were. And uh, I just thought there's some good reason, you know. The book probably wasn't any good. <laughs> so I started writing it again. But you see, Bob, when people are hearing this, they're thinking, they can't even wrap their head around that kind of calmness of mind, mm. that kind of demeanor. So this comes from awareness, your ability to it respond? It does, listen, if you're not calm, you're tied up in a knot, you, you solve nothing. Mm. Energy flows to and through us. When we're uptight, it's like putting a kink in a garden hose. Yeah. And wonder why the water doesn't flow freely. Yeah. If you want the energy to flow freely through you and get good results, you've got to be calm. So the trick is don't let anything outside really upset you. Now there's another side to this. If you let something outside get you excited, mm -hmm. you're going to let something outside get you depressed. Mm. because you're reacting to what's going on outside. So if something really good happens, you get excited. Something bad happens, you're going to get depressed. Mm. That's because you're letting the outside control you. I don't think you should get excited about anything. I think you should get enthused about it. See, excitement has a polar opposite, and it's depressed. Mm -hmm. Enthusiasm doesn't have a polar opposite. Enthusiasm is in God. It comes from the Latin entheos, in God. And it just is. Just is. Nothing good nor bad, just is. Everything just is in truth. You know? So it's a bit of a philosophy you gotta get into, and then you train yourself to think and live that way. Mm -hmm. You know what you just made me think of? When you talked about how you're tied in a knot and you're not allowing the energy to flow, it reminds me of when you're looking for your keys. You've gotta get out the door <laughs> and you're looking for your keys and you're all knotted up, panic. stressed. It's panic. It's panic. And nothing happens, you don't find them. No, you don't find them at all until when you, you calm, calm down, down. Then you start to find them. Then you start to find them. Yeah. I love what um, Sandy writes here in the introduction. Sandy, your business partner. She says this in the book. She says, by letting the ideas in this book fill your consciousness, your life will instantly become a fascinating journey. But that journey is not going to begin as if you're walking through a beautiful flower garden. When you lay this book down, you'll be confronted by construction sites, detours, and potholes. In other words, a respectable amount of resistance from virtually everyone you know. That's I'm speaking true. from experience, she says. Did that happen to you when you got into this material? Oh, yes. Really? Absolutely, it did. Sure, it did. Yeah. Um, it did. I was so fascinated with it, though, I couldn't stop listening to it or reading it. See, I, got, I, was, only, I was only reading this for a short time, and then I found where Earl Nightingale, a broadcaster in uh, Chicago, a radio broadcaster, 
guy had such a great voice. He had condensed this book and narrated it on a record. And so I would drive around with a battery-operated record player um, playing the record. I was, I was absolutely fascinated with the information. You know, keep in mind, I was born during the Depression in 1934, yeah. right in the heart of the Depression. Um, when I'm five, six years old, just starting school, the whole world went to war. So everything's rationed. Um, fathers are all gone. Mm -hmm. uh, mother's working in war plant. Grandmother's trying to raise three of us. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of attention given to anybody. It was not a good time. Food was rationed. Everything was rationed. So I grew up, lack and limitation was sort of the order of the day for everybody. And everybody lived that way. I mean, so it wasn't that we were just bad off and nobody else was. And when I started to listen to this, the idea you could have whatever you want, that you've got these mental faculties if you start using them, you know, that you're God's highest form of creation. And uh, I don't mean that from a religious perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about from today, living today. Mm -hmm. um, I just never lost my fascination for it. I study it every day. It makes me think like it spoke to your soul, like it spoke well, it to did. something For deep sure it inside did. of you. Absolutely it did. You see, I think we are a soul. We don't have one. We mm. are one. And I believe our spiritual DNA is perfect. There's perfection within every one of us. Mm -hmm. And that perfection is seeking expression with and through us. That's why you're always going to want something. That's why you'll never be satisfied. If you run, you want to run faster. If you jump, you want to jump higher. If you sell, you want to sell more. Doesn't matter what you do. You're going to want to do it better. And that is because the essence of what's inside of your spirit is always for expansion and fuller expression. So you want to do it bigger. You want to do it better, faster. You know. But here's what's remarkable to me as you're describing the environment that you grew up in, which was all around you. And mm -hmm. as we know, so you, it's through your five senses. Mm -hmm. You're seeing, hearing, tasting, smell, and touching this environment. You're in it. You're hearing this material that's touching your soul. You're hearing this material. Like it had to be such a big pull when everything around you is saying, there is no way that can be possible. Well, that's true. But that's one of the things he says in the book. Okay, so you heard it enough he said, times. You know, he said, if you want to win and you, want, and you follow other people, yeah. he said, if you see a large group of people going one way and one or two going the other way, follow the one or two. Wow. The others have never known where they're going to go. Ninety-some percent of the population struggle all the way through life. Mm -hmm. School doesn't teach us how to take control of our life. I don't care where you go, and I don't care how long you go or how far you go in school. It does not teach us how to control ourself. Mm -hmm. We've got to get involved with self, really understand who we are. Mm -hmm. um, so everything, every time you would caution you, you look around, you see it, it's all around you. Right. Everybody's telling you, you're crazy, you can't do that, you know? And when I quit the fire department, I quit the fire department going to clean offices, everybody thought I'd really out of my mind. In fact, I was really questioning myself at one point uh, because I was the second person since 1934 to quit the fire department. No one quit that job and they couldn't fire you. I mean, it was like having a pension and you only worked half the time, you know? And when you were working at night, you'd sleep. I mean, it was like being retired because I was in a slow haul. If you're in a busy place, well, that's different. Downtown Toronto would not be a good place. But at any rate, um, I got into that and I thought, I can't stay here because they were sitting around doing nothing, wanting to play cards or play darts and I'm thinking, I know, I gotta do something, I gotta do something. So I eventually quit. And I went and started cleaning offices, yeah. And you hired some of those oh, I firefighters. Had, I had about 10% of them working for me at one time. You see, I, everybody thought I was quitting to go and clean offices. Yeah. But I was quitting to go and build a company. Mm. And I didn't have any formal education, I didn't have any business experience, so everybody thought, well, well what makes you think you can build a company? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know what it made me think it, but I could think it, you see? And um, 
I went from earning 4000 a year to 14500 a month in a year. Now get this for a minute. The fire chief of East York at that time was earning $11,200 a year. A first class fireman was earning $4,000 a year. There was only one chief. Now there was a couple of district chiefs, but the chief, the fire chief, 11200 a year. I got to a point where I was earning $14,500 a month. I mean, it was just, it was an unreal change. You talk about quantum leaps. And it just kept growing. I kept, if I could see it in my mind, like the book was telling me, if you can see it in your mind, you can hold it in your hand. In other words, if you can get the picture, then you can do it. See, we're creative beings. That's how everything starts. Everything. These cameras, the microphones, the lights, everything started out as a picture mm -hmm. in somebody's mind. Well, I was starting to understand this because I was listening to it all day long as I was driving around I was listening to the records. And I thought, if I can get the picture, then I can go and do it. And so that's what I would do. And so, Bob, when you were even making more than the fire chief, more in a month than he would make in a year, were you still scared was, to quit? I was still in the fire. Absolutely, I was scared to quit. Yeah. Even when you were seeing yeah. that you were making the money? Even when I was... You see, conditioning's a funny thing. I know. It really is. It's insidious. Yes. Um, I was breaking a paradigm. I was going against my conditioned way of thinking. Your mind is conditioned. Everybody's mind is conditioned. It's conditioned first genetically and then environmentally. So we're conditioned to believe there's security in a job. Well, that is absurd. There's no such thing as security in a job. If you think there's security in a job, you lose your job, you're going to be totally demoralized because you've lost everything. Security is an inside thing. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't got it there, you haven't got it. Well, I was starting to develop this feeling of security. Now, still quitting, I was scared, but I quit. I gave a month's notice. I didn't have to give a month's notice. I only had to give two weeks. I gave a month. Was the month for you or for or them? Or for me. It was for me. <laughs> it was for me. It kept me safe. You see, I could stay yeah. there. So anyway, um, the second I walked out the door, I knew I'd done the right thing. Mm. But I had to walk out the door. So you got to do it. I know. It's like we want to know we've done the right thing before we walk, th walk out the door. Yeah. We, want, we want a prediction. We want to know it's going to be okay. And even as you said that, Bob, about security, I can tell you, I was talking to someone the other day. Even now, all these years later, people will still have a very difficult time accepting what you have just said, oh, that their well, security does not, not come from their job. But they have benefits. They have a pension. Yeah, yeah well, they can buy the benefits. I know. And, um, see, I'm... I'm an entrepreneur at heart, yeah, you know, and I think the more free you become, the more of an entrepreneur you become. Yeah, I've got to play my own game. Yeah, and uh, I know there's no limit to what I can do, so I just keep doing it. You know, you keep building the picture, and you help as many other people as you can build the same picture, do the same thing. You know, I remember you saying that we're here in your studio and there was a contractor that was obviously working on the studio and he looked at you and he was like, how old are you? And how much is this going to cost? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know, yeah. you've got pictures, you've got things to do. We were, um, I think we built it three years ago. Yeah. It cost us probably, I think we spent a little over a million dollars on it. And... But I've got a studio, I've got a TV station in my backyard. Mm -hmm. This is literally a TV station. Mm -hmm. And we can broadcast all over the world from here, and we do. Um, and I was 83, and somebody said, you're building a studio, and you're, you're 83? Well, I'm 86 now, and we're taking the top off the house. We're adding 2,500 square feet to the house. So we had to move out while it's done. So I'm about a small place around the corner that... Um, I'll live in while they finish this. It'll take about six months. But then I can keep coming back here to work because I'll be close by. If you let your age, your gender, your education, your bank account, anything control your thinking, you're in a little prison of your own making. 
Yeah. And uh, uh, that's not a good place to be. Mm -hmm. It's just a bad place to be. You know, Bob, I, I'm thinking about when you started to make money, and because this is so interesting, because we all do this, so I'd love to hear more about this from you. You start to make money, so you buy a nice car. Mm -hmm. But I guess there was still a little bit of disparity in your self-image and the car, because you oh. would park it far away <laughs> from your meeting. No question about it. Listen, when I worked in the gas station, there was a guy, Mr. Devere. He would come in, he'd park this great big long Cadillac by the pumps. Yeah. We'd be working inside, working on a car, and we'd see the car out there. When we saw that car there, the drill was you'd go, you fill the car up with gas, you check the tires, you empty the ashtray, you clean the windows, you check the oil, and then you go in the glove compartment, and right against the wall of the glove compartment is a credit card. You go in and run the credit card, put it back in the, in the glove compartment, and then go back to work. This guy put more gas in the car. I was wondering how he got the money to put the gas in the car, because he was forever filling it up. How he bought the car never entered my mind. <laughs> but I always wanted a Cadillac because of that. Really? And I had enough money in the bank to buy four or five Cadillacs. And I went downtown, and I went in the Cadillac showroom, and as soon as the salesperson started to come over toward me, I'd get out of there. And one day I went in, and the guy got over to me and says, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I'm going to buy this. Oh, okay. And uh, he said, you want to know the price? Well, it's okay. You know. And so he said, well, how are you going to I said, I'll give you a check. He said, okay. This guy was very skeptical. <laughs> and I said, can I take it with me? <laughs> well, no, we're going to have to service the car. He said, <laughs> what he didn't say is we're going to have to make sure this check isn't going to bounce all over the city. And uh, I got the car. I was afraid to let anybody see me in it. I'd park it around the corner, and if I saw you walking down the street and I was driving, I would hide so that you wouldn't see me driving mm. the car. Uh, my self-image didn't fit in that car. Although I wanted the car, my self-image wouldn't fit in. Now I changed that because I got where I, when I recognized what was going on, um, I started to understand self-image and I changed it. You know. I think a lo I think many of us still worry about that. Worry about what other people will think. Oh, well, that's, a, that's another thing, too. You know, that, it's a spin-off of that. Terry Whitaker wrote a book. Mm. It's titled, What You Think of Me is None of My Business. Mm -hmm. And it's so true. We spend too much time worrying about what someone else thinks. And I think that comes from when we're little kids. Our parents would say, what would the neighbors think? Right. Uh, I found out they don't. <laughs> <laughs> the neighbors don't think. we got to quit worrying about what somebody else thinks. Yeah. What we've got to be concerned with is what we think. Yes. Because what we think is controlling our life, you know. Yeah. And it's so interesting because worrying about what people think keeps us small. It keeps us from not doing certain things Absolutely. because we're worried about how we'll be perceived. So even our successes, we don't mm -hmm. want to share it. We don't want to come across as bragging or who do we think we are mm -hmm. showing up in that Cadillac, Mr. Proctor. Yeah. Um, you know what I love, Bob? I love when we go to your events. And, and if you haven't been to an event, you've got to get to one. This is what you're going to notice is, Bob, at your events, you have people of all different races, all different ages, different religions. You have devout Muslims, devout Jews, Christians, people that are not religious, they are religious. I have not seen that from any other event I've been to with other speakers in your space. Why do you, you think that You say they is? all have one thing in common, they're people. <laughs> but it's your messaging. Yeah. Yes, they do have one thing in you common, see, they're people. But what I, is it about you? Well, I believe we're all the same. Mm. Uh, the religion is an accepted concept. That's what religion is. Mm -hmm. um, people are not born Christians. They're born. And Christian is a belief system. Right. They adopt from the parents or the Jew or the Muslim. Um, I think we should set all that stuff aside and look at the potential that we've got and then how to develop that potential, how to alter that subconscious conditioning, the paradigm, mm -hmm. how to put a new one in. Mm -hmm. See, we've, what we've, we've really got a program 
in our subconscious mind. It's like our biocomputer. And this program uh, was put there by somebody else. So the people that wrote the code for the program that's literally controlling our life had no idea what the hell they were doing. Mm. They really didn't know much. It's been passed down from great-grandparents to grandparents, you know, and down. And that's how we're conditioned as children. So it's genetic. You know, there's a particle energy from mom and particle from dad come together. That forms the nucleus of you. And that keeps an attractive force going. And 280 days later, you make your debut on the planet. <laughs> well, there's been a lot of conditioning going on there. Yeah. All that DNA, it's all there. Every idea that they believe is built right into the genes, mm -hmm. our belief system. And it's our belief system that controls us. Now, when we start to question some of our beliefs, that's when our life starts to change. Like the belief, well, <laughs> I'll give you a good one that yeah. we're operating with. Women are not as valuable as men. Mm -hmm. And you'd say, God, this is 2020. That, mm -hmm. that idea's gone long ago. Not on the paycheck, it isn't. You're right. You're still, I think a woman gets about 70% of what a man gets. Mm -hmm. It's absurd. That's why you find so many women now becoming entrepreneurs and very successful ones too. Well, look at your company. Our company's run by women, really. Yeah. The most successful consultants we've got, almost all women. Yeah. Earning millions, really. Yes, absolutely. So you said that, so we get this conditioning, we're in the, in the, culture in the environment that we're brought up in and what I think happens what I've started to realize is that we start to accept things that are fa as fact that are opinion that oh, are beliefs that sure. could be changed well another thing look at it this way we go to school we read the book we answer questions on the content of the book that the teacher puts together mm -hmm. and if we get a certain mark we pass and if you did this year after year, let's say for eight years, then they'll put you in high school, or maybe it's 10, I don't know, and on through university, but it's the same deal. You get the book, you study the book, and then you answer questions on the content. So you've got people going out into the world, they pass their exams, they've got excellent grades, they've got degrees, and they're failing miserably. Why? Mm -hmm because they've never really understood and applied the information that's in the book. What they got wasn't an education at all. They gathered information. They gathered knowledge. Knowledge on its own is no good. If knowledge was valuable, all librarians would be <laughs> multi-zillionaires. Knowledge is not valuable. Knowledge has to be organized and then intelligently directed. And that's what we've done at the Proctor Gallagher Institute. You know, we've organized knowledge and we intelligently direct it. And I feel like we just have to let people take this in. This is huge. This is huge because people feel like they have to forever gather information. They don't know enough to start anything. I don't know enough. I have to research this. I have to research that. Uh, and you see people going back to school to get another degree because yeah. they have trouble getting a job. And what you said about what you do here at the Proctor Gallagher Institute, I, you know, as you know, my background is in psychotherapy. And what I tell people is I don't think I have found anything better than the Thinking Into Results program personally in a way to facilitate change at that subconscious level, have a transformation, but mm -hmm. in a shorter amount of time. Like, I love people, but I don't need to be with them for years. They mm -hmm. may not want to be with me for years. Um, and this is what I love about it, is that you can have that transformation, but it's because, it's exactly what you just said, it's organized. Mm -hmm. It's organized and it's intelligently organized directed. And intelligently directed. And honestly, we have to thank Sandy Gallagher for that. Yeah. The program itself, yes. Sandy put it together. See, what Sandy did, she studied everything that I do. Yeah. And then she said, now I'm going to take certain things that you know and put them together yes. in an organized manner so that we could take it into a corporation. So absolutely, she gets full credit for that. But the growth of the company she gets credit for too. Um, I've been in the business a long time when I met Sandy Gallagher. Now she's been with us now 14 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but she's a financial genius. Mm -hmm. She was a, a securities lawyer, I mean, buying and selling banks. She was a very successful person, but 
she, um, she wasn't really fulfilled, I guess. And so she um, started to study everything we got, and then she became a partner in the company. And I think it's because of her perspective that she was able to organize it and then create thinking into results in a way mm -hmm. that she knew was needed. In yeah. a way, because honestly, mm -hmm. you're taking big concepts here, mm -hmm. but you're making it simple mm -hmm. so that we, it's accessible to everybody. That's what I think is so incredible. And, yeah. you know, of course, people, this was originally intended maybe for corporations, for teams, but for anybody, uh, for anybody. I use this with people um, in their marriages. Sure. Like you start doing yeah. what you know how to do in your marriage. Mm -hmm. What well, do you things see? Get better. Sandy was buying and selling banks, merging banks. And there was once she was in the boardroom and two, two banks were going to come together. They would have been very successful. Mm -hmm. They just couldn't seem to meet. They, they, it was simple ideas that were stopping them. And she thought, if only I had something. And that's what she was thinking of when she was studying all my material. Mm. If I had this organized and took them into those boardrooms, it would change the game. And so that's what she did. Well, that's, you guys have changed the game. You've touched mm. millions of lives. Mm. You know, Bob, I see people come up at events to you, and I see how you take in and accept. Their, they, there's so mm. much gratitude always pouring out mm. to you. But one thing you've told anybody that works with you and you caution us on is don't drink your own bath water, no. which is kind of gross. But what do you mean by that? Listen, we, uh, we really do help people. Yeah. There's no question about it. But we don't help everybody. Mm. The person has to take it and use the information. Now, if they're the ones that's taking and using it, they gotta get credit for it. We can't take credit for it. We'll take credit for putting the information together, but we can't take credit for the change that's taking place in them. Now, they haven't learned that yet, so they write us beautiful letters and uh, you've done so much for me. I had a mentor way back, he said, Bob, don't read that stuff. Don't even read the letters. I may read one periodically if somebody asks me to read one, but I really don't pay any attention to that because I know they don't know. I did not change them. I don't deserve the credit for that. They deserve the credit for that. They just haven't learned that yet. I deserve the credit for the change I've made in me. Mm -hmm. You deserve the credit for the change you've made in you. Mm -hmm. You see? And they don't understand that in the beginning. And what's the danger when we start to believe that, oh, we oh, have well, made the change in that getting, person? You get in trouble. Yeah. You're in serious trouble. Um, I think that's when you're on your way out of business. Really? Yeah. 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 Um, Corey Kelly Proctor, head of the consultant division. Mm -hmm. This is how she said she imagines you feel about mm -hmm. this part of your company. She said, Bob holds the consultant division near and dear to his heart. Mm -hmm. This is how Bob began his journey when he signed on with Nightingale Conant. He knows the self-doubts and frustrations that a consultant will face and also the incredible rewards they will achieve when they persist. I believe he also sees this, the consultants, as his legacy. Do you see it as your legacy? Listen, I don't, I don't really spend any time thinking about legacy. I don't really care about legacy. I, I don't. I think that's the same as reading some of these letters. I'm only interested in what I'm doing right now while I'm mm. here. Uh, when I'm gone, I'm gone. And I don't buy into all that stuff. If it becomes a legacy, it'll become a legacy, but mm, that's no intent of mine. Mm. I just want everybody to really understand this. I want the consultants to understand um, the way I understand it, and many of them are. Yeah. And they're doing a phenomenal job. Yeah. You know? I was just watching a a video on my phone, it came through WhatsApp. Is that yeah, yeah. WhatsApp? Well, I had it on my phone, but I didn't know I had it on my phone. <laughs> and um, I come across it yesterday, and there was a message there from Kim Calvert. Yes. And it was a video. And I'm watching, and I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. Here's this little girl, and she is a little girl. But when, when Bob says little, she's... Small. She's small. Yeah, 
She was working as a nurse, yep. 35000 a year. She sold her car to get into this. But she was making this movie in front of a brand new... Um, oh, uh, was it the car, the Ferrari? The Ferrari. Yeah. Yeah. A uh, quarter of a million pounds. Yeah. This is one of the top lines. And it was parked in front of this beautiful home yeah. that she owns. And these things were paid for. She's done a great job with this. Now, there's others that have done a great job, too. Yeah. But I was watching that, and I thought, wow, this is so good. It's so cool. And here's the best part about the Ferrari. Because she's so little, um, they had to adjust the seats <laughs> and specially adjust them for her, the driver's seat, so now nobody else can drive it. So she could see out the window. So she, so she, <laughs> they funny. had to raise yeah. it up so she could see out the window. So you've shared this material around the world, and what a, you got to get a kick out of this that now we, like other people, are sharing, mm -hmm. uh, who are around the world, are sharing your material. But you have shared around it around the world. What's your favorite country? Um, Malaysia. Why? I'm not sure. I know. Um. I just. I just love Malaysia. I love the people. Um, I spent a lot of time there. Yeah. Uh, deliberately, I would keep going back. Um, I think it's the energy of the place. It's a very spiritual country. Like you've got um, 18 million people there. Half of them are Muslim, so they're praying five times a day. You've got a lot of, um, of Muslims, or of um, um, Buddhists. Mm -hmm. They unashamedly play in their, pray in their little mm -hmm. chapels on the street. And you've got a strong Christian community over around Kuching. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of praying going on. And, I've, and of course, you've got the forest, too. You know? So it's um, the jungle. Mm -hmm. So it's the energy of the place, I think, mm -hmm. that I like. I love it there. I really do. The people are... I went down to Kota Kinabalu. It's right on the coast. It used to be Borneo. Mm -hmm. One of the most beautiful places in the rainforest. Um, I didn't even know where Malaysia was at one time. I love it now. Is it true that instead of coffee breaks, you had prayer breaks? Well, for sure, yeah. Now this is in a lot of places. Yeah. Yeah, any Muslim country, you'd have prayer breaks. Yeah. So you've got to find out what time the prayer is because they're yeah. at a different time every day. So it was one of the first things we'd find out in the morning is what time is prayer. Yeah. Having said that, you are a proud Canadian. I love this story, Bob. This is from Linda, your uh -huh. wife. She tells this story in this book, Inspired, which I don't know if people can get. I don't think they can. I think this was something special made for you. Yeah, These are probably. stories from family and friends. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a good book. It's so good. I, they gave me that for my 75th birthday, I think. You had to be in the family to put a story in it. Oh. Mark Victor Hansen wrote the foreword. Yes. But other than that, it's all family. And some of these stories are really little kids, you know? Yeah, and we're going to hear one now from Linda about you being a Canadian. Yeah. She says, Bob is a Canadian, a very proud Canadian. I, on the other hand, hail from south of the border, the United States. This has presented some interesting situations, conversations, and debates over the years. Some time ago, Bob and I traveled to the U.S. to attend a friend's wedding. We flew in the day before to enjoy the pre-wedding festivities. <laughs> it's not often that there is absolutely nothing on his schedule on any given morning. So this rare occasion, we lingered in bed to fully enjoy the freedom from his hectic schedule. We were engaged in a quiet conversation, which turned into a debate about our respective countries. Bob was winning the argument, until I mentioned to him that I had recently read in a Toronto newspaper that the Canadian Navy had lost one of its three submarines in the Great Lakes. Well, this was just too much for him to overcome. So in his loudest voice possible, 
and without regard to the other hotel guests, Bob began to sing the Canadian national anthem, <laughs> Oh Canada. I tried to stop him. I tried to quiet him down, but he insisted on singing the song right to the end. Yeah. I can only imagine what the folks in the surrounding rooms were thinking. We were in Alabama, for Pete's sake. <laughs> well, you would stop and think about it. You know, you're talking about the American Navy. Isn't it? Yeah. Dominant in the world. Canada has three submarines, or had, I don't know if they have any now, and they lost one of them in the Great Lakes. I mean, you talk about a bit of an embarrassment. I, I was beat. I couldn't win. I started to sing O Canada. Yeah. And it still makes you laugh so much. Oh, God, that was so funny. Yeah, I'd forgotten all about that. Yeah. You know, Bob, it, she continues to say, though, that um, you really take your responsibility about being a Canadian very seriously, especially when it comes to voting, mm -hmm. that you take the time to get to know the candidates and what they stand for, and yeah. you vote, um, you, you know, you vote all the time. What does Canada mean to you in being Canadian? Oh, well, it's a great, Canada's a great country. Yeah. Um, we, um, We've taken in people from all over the world here. Mm -hmm. I watched it happen because the, the, the uh, flood of immigration really came after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Toronto was a very dull city up until the end of the Second World War. It's probably one of the most cosmopolitan cities to, in the world today. I read one day where there's over 100 languages spoken in Toronto. Yeah. Well, that certainly there wasn't a case uh, prior to uh, 1945 or 1946 or 47, when they really, there was a very heavy flow of immigration. I think Canada is a great country. Mm. It's, um, it's a big country with a small population, mm -hmm. you know. Um, there's more people in Southern California than there is in Canada, mm -hmm. but it's a huge country, you know. So I, uh, I like being a Canadian. Yeah, because you could yeah. live anywhere. But I like the Americans, too. I yeah. like being in the States. Yeah. I think America's a great country, too. Yeah. You know, it's... Um, America's really the country of uh, entrepreneurs, yes. opportunity. No question about it. Yeah. It's so big. And uh, you've got all those states. And I'm very fortunate that I can travel around. I have visa to do that, and I feel very privileged, you know. Yeah. Speaking of travel, you recently did something that you've never done before. Mm. You were an actor in a movie. I was. <laughs> and here is what one of the producers, Kelly Spascuzzi, said about you on set. Bob was the most interested one on set. He obviously understands the value of specialized knowledge, so he made it a priority to connect with our director and actors prior to his scene. Because, because he had such a sincere interest to understand everyone's roles and also to see what he could learn. He did share with me though, that he did hit the terror barrier, but didn't stay there very long. Some people, Bob, don't know what the terror barrier is. Can you explain what that is and how that showed up in that situation for you? It's an emotional wall I think you hit when you go to do something you've never done before. Mm -hmm. That you consider Fairly difficult to do. You hit, you get scared, and you want to back away. Yeah. And you're stepping out of your comfort zone, really. And if you're not doing that, you're not growing. So the terror barrier is actually an indication you're growing. But it's a scary situation, yeah. I was a priest <laughs> in a movie, yeah. What was it like, Bob? I mean, you were I, Well, last there's a year, funny right? story on yeah. this. I got there, and um, they had me in this priest's row, and it's, it was an old church in uh, Louisiana down in New Orleans, mm -hmm. and it was an interesting old building, and so I was asking this old guy that was in the church questions, and he knew all about the church. He was telling me all about it, and it was really interesting. Well, Leslie Uggams, the singer, yeah. she was in the movie, and her husband was there with her was an Australian, nice guy. And he was asked, he started, a, like I had never met him, he didn't know me. He was asking me questions about the church and I was telling him all about it. He thought I was the priest of the church. I mean, he really thought I was the authentic priest. Well, we went out for dinner that oh night my gosh. Yeah. with Leslie and her husband. And he was shocked when he found out I wasn't a priest. <laughs> 
I was just the actor priest, yeah. yeah. That was a great experience. I'll, I'll probably do it again. Would you? Yeah, oh yeah, I'll do it again. Yeah, yeah. oh I'll my get gosh. Filled, my, filled my, uh, uh, I love that. I'll get Phil to put me in a movie, yeah. Yeah, Phil, get Bob in a movie. <laughs> he sees it in his mind, so it's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah. You know, Bob, one of the things many times people say, and you've heard this countless times, I wanna teach this to my children. I wanna teach them how to mm. think. I wanna, you know, teach this material to them. And I always think, I think, well, the best way to teach it is to be it, is Absolutely. to live it. And it, this makes me think of another story in Inspired with your um, grandson. And your grandson, I just love this story, because he, he was um, nine at the time, mm -hmm. Giancarlo. Sure. He says, he was nine when he wrote this. He says, when I was eight, my grandma was in the hospital. I was very sad because she was very sick. My sisters and I stayed at my grandpa and grandma's Linda's house for a few days because my dad and mom wanted to be with her. I was cuddling with grandpa on the couch and he was watching golf. I was pretty upset, so he stopped watching golf and talked to me. He asked me to tell him how I was feeling. He told me to stop thinking about her sick in the hospital. He said to think of all the good times that I had with her. He asked me questions about all the fun times I had with my grandma and remembering those times made me smile. Grandpa taught me not to think about all the negative things and that I should only think of positive things. Sometimes it's hard, but there are always ways to do that. And when you do, you feel good. I think that's how you teach it, isn't it? Yeah, I'm asked that all the time, and the best way to teach it is to live it, do it. Yeah. You know, the, your kids are following your pattern. Mm -hmm. They really are, whether you like it or not. And that's kind of scary sometimes. Almost all welfare recipients are third, fourth, fifth gen generation welfare recipients. You know, there's a pattern, and kids get in that pattern. So the best way to uh, teach this information to the kids is to live it. You're right. Yeah, we're living this right now, thanks to you, Bob. So my oldest, who's 12, was like, I'd like to have a dog. And I was like, no, like we've already got a dog. I, I was saying no, and he said, okay. So he just started writing, and he'd say, just wake me up in the morning. So I'd wake him up in the morning. He goes, I want to wake me up earlier than normal. And I said, okay, and he would write his goal. <laughs> I was like, damn it, who's teaching you this stuff? Yeah. He would write his goal. He would visualize it. He would go on Amazon and look at dog beds. And then that energy gets me involved, and now I'm looking for dogs. Well, he just adopted his dog. Uh, it's a Jack Russell Chihuahua mix. Gorgeous little one named Tulip, um, who mm -hmm. was actually from Texas, mm -hmm. from the States on the streets. And they're falling in love as we speak. But that is it. He sees what we do, and he just applied it, and he right. completely ignored yeah. us. Yeah. Um, That's so good. Speaking of children and age, one thing I want to ask you is a question that you asked a few of us. Mm -hmm. We were at a training in LA and you said to us in a small group, if you forgot your age, how old would you say you are? I want to ask you that. Um, I'm 40, 45. Oh. Yeah. I work the same as I was working then. Mm -hmm. Age is a funny thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is. It's some crazy thing in our head. I don't think any person, when they get older, they feel older. Now, some do, some, and some act like they're old people. I don't, somebody asked me how I stay so young. I told them I don't hang around old people, and I don't. Yeah. I don't mix with any old people. Almost all the people I mix with are much younger than me. They're in the company, because we're working all the time, you know? 30, 40, maybe 50. But outside of that, you know, age is, age is you're as old as you think you are, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we started the conversation with what 10-year-old Bob would think of the life you've created. If you could meet your 10-year-old self, what advice would you give him? You know, I've thought of that in a different manner mm -hmm. for a long time, probably none. 
Really? I wouldn't want to change anything that I've done. I, um, I'm very effective at this. I know I'm very effective at it. And that is because I changed so much. There was such an enormous change took place in my life. So when I see a person that's struggling or having a tough time, or maybe they got a poor self-image or something, I know exactly where they're at, so I know how to help them. Because I've been there. And they may not know I've been there, but our conversation will work. So I don't think I'd really change anything. I wouldn't, I, I really, I've had a great life and I plan to keep going. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I want it to be bigger and better. You know, Bob, as you say that, I just wanted to mention one thing here is that we see your generosity. I mean, it, we know what you do with the Unstoppable Foundation. I don't even know if you've probably lost count of mm -hmm. how much you've donated, how many schools have been built, how many lives have been touched. Mm -hmm. But you leaving everyone with the impression of increase, your generosity, there's so, that's just who you are because there's so much that people don't see that you just do mm -hmm. as an extension of who you are. And you really attribute this quality in you to your mother. Yeah, when, um, when we were kids, it'd probably be around 1943, 44 it was particularly bad winter I mean a lot of snow and it was cold and there was a family in 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 school I was in the class with one of the boys there was two or three boys and a girl and they had no fuel they had no heat at home everybody heated their house with coal in a furnace and they didn't have any coal and I told my mother about it and she had me she went away and she got a $20 bill and she had it all folded up. Mm -hmm. She said, I want you to go to the store and get two tens for this. And I brought back the two tens, she gave me one. You take it to that boy's mother and let her get a, a ton of coal. You get a ton of coal for, two, for $10. Yeah. And she didn't even know them. That, well, I'm still talking about it, yeah. you know, 75 years later. Um, so it really impressed me. Yeah. But you see, I've studied money, too, and I've studied it very carefully. If you don't give it away, you're not going to be happy. Um, money is used to extend the good you do far beyond your own presence. Mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of ways you can help people with money. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way you can help some people. Um, the people that hoard it, People that I've known that were always very tight with their money, they were not happy people. I have no desire to save great piles of money. So in that case then, is it your obligation to be rich? Oh, well, there's no question about that. I think it is. There's no question about that. Um, money is a reward received for service rendered. Mm -hmm. So the more service you provide, the more money you'll receive. Mm -hmm. Like you'll often hear um, uh, a singer that's earning millions of dollars mm -hmm. and somebody will say, well, they're just not worth that much. Well, yes, they are. Right. They made a recording that millions of people love listening to. Yeah. They're entertaining millions of people. Yeah. They're only in the studio maybe for a week to record it, but they're paid millions because they're entertaining a lot of people. It's the reward received for service rendered. The more service you provide, the more money you earn. A lot of people think you go to work to earn money. That's the worst way to earn money. Mm -hmm. But that's what we're taught. We're raised to believe you go to work to earn money. You go to work for satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So you should be doing what you absolutely love doing. Mm -hmm. You provide service to earn money. You can earn money while you're sleeping. I earn money while I'm sleeping. And we teach people. We even set up a company, the MSI Connect. We set that company up to teach people how to set up multiple sources of income. And so on that note, is it important to pay your mentors? Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You see, if I'm teaching you something you don't pay me, you'll place little or no value on that. Mm. Anything you get for nothing, you place little or no value on. Mm -hmm. 
Um, a lot of people that come into this business, they have a difficult time charging for their service. Yeah. I don't have any trouble at all. I charge a lot and I brag about it. <laughs> now, I charge, I, I don't need the money that I earn. I really don't. But that's not the point. If I charge you a lot for something, you're going to really pay attention. Mm -hmm. I charged you a lot. You did. And you really paid attention. I did. Do you think mentors are important? I think they're everything. You change your life. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you're very effective at this. Yeah. You see? You're very effective at it for the same reason I am. It changed my life. Yes. Yeah, people that are afraid to ask for the money, they don't understand money. I have no difficulty. People can always afford what they want. If they were to look around their home, almost everything they see, they don't need. They got it because they wanted it. Yeah. And they always find the money to get it. If they go into their wardrobe or their clothes closet, there's, more, there's clothes in there they will never wear. Yeah. Again, never. Good clothes. And yet they'll buy more. Not because they need it. They buy more because they want it. We always find the money for what we want. So when a person really wants to change their life, they will find the money and they will get into a good... See, I think we've got the best program in the world. Mm -hmm. I really do. Mm -hmm. And I don't say that because our name's on it. I say that because of the results we get. That's right, because it's not about gathering information. This program is about changing your life, changing your results, and that's how we know if we've learned something. And we work all over the world with it. Yeah. I've been to China, I've been to Monastery. I've literally been all over the world. Yeah. There's no place you go that people are not using this and benefiting from it. You said if people are afraid to charge, they don't understand money. No, they don't. Could you just explain that? They a don't bit? understand money and they think they have low self-esteem. Oh, okay, so it's tied to how they feel about oh, themselves. Absolutely, absolutely. And they don't understand it. They don't understand that if they give it to the person, the person's not going to use it. When they pay for it, they will use it. If I told you, by the way, that's just a nice dress you got on. Thank you. If I told you I saw a beautiful yellow dress, mm. this thing is really classy. You'll love it. Mm -hmm. And it's only $64. Mm. You probably wouldn't even go to look at it. Mm -hmm. You see, our desire follows our dollar. Our desire follows our dollar. That it is something does. to write down. Yeah. Our desire well, follows our yeah. dollar. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then, you know, Bob, I, I, we're, we're wrapping up here, but one of the things I see so many times for people that want to do your programs, for people that want to work with you, is that if it was for their child, if it was something for somebody else, in a heartbeat, wouldn't even think about it. They're investing. Mm. Why is it difficult for us to invest in ourselves? We've never been trained to. Okay. We've never been taught yeah. to train, to develop ourselves. We've never been taught to even think highly of ourselves. Right. Don't love yourself, that's conceit. Love others. You can't love somebody else if you don't love yourself. Right. If you haven't got it, you can't give it. We've been programmed the wrong way. We don't put the proper value on education. And then you have to understand what education really is. Mm -hmm. See, I believe what we do is real education. What they get in the school system is not real education. Mm -hmm. They're gathering information. Mm -hmm. Think of all the people that come out of our school systems. This is all over the world, mm -hmm. not just here. With degrees coming off the end of a business card, and they can't find work. They're working for a little bit of money. You have multiplied your income. You're a professional. Mm -hmm. How many times more have you multiplied your income? Oh, I don't even know. I'd have to do the math. But I don't, I've stopped counting, to be honest. I was thinking about that today. Many times. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But we're not taught, and we have judgment on it. It's selfish. I should, you know, I shouldn't oh, be yeah. doing this. It's inc that's incredible. Okay. So brings, let's bring this in for a landing, Bob. Um, I'd like to call this the couch back to my psychotherapy days where we'll do some free association. So I just want you to say the first word that comes to mind. Here we go. Favorite dessert? Ice cream. Really? Mm. What flavor? Vanilla. Really? 
Favorite animal? Dog. Oh. My dog. Your... My little Pomeranian. Oh, Dolly. Yeah. Your best habit? Discipline. I'm very disciplined. Mother? I think mothers are the most important people in the world. I had a phenomenal mother. Mm -hmm. In fact, when my brother and I, and sister and I get on the phone, we're always saying, God bless mother. Mother made a, a change in her life that was huge when she moved to Toronto yeah. from a little town. Everybody told her she was crazy. Our life is so good today because of that move. God bless mother. Mothers are very important. Fatherhood. I don't relate to it that much. My own father I never had any relationship with. I like being a father. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I enjoy the kids. I enjoy the grandkids. I love it. And great grand. You oh, have a yeah. great granddaughter, great, yeah. right? Yeah. Coming over here Friday morning for a swim. Aww. Yeah. The soul. You are a soul. God. You don't get one. Oh, sorry. You don't, you don't have a soul. You are a soul. I am and the it, soul. You are. And when you understand that, it makes a big difference. Mm. The soul is forever seeking its awareness of its oneness with God. God is everything. God is everything. All-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present. Everything is God. Our responsibility is to gain our awareness of our oneness with God. Mm. Well, then you answered my next one, which was God. So God is everything. Absolutely. And the final word, the first word that comes to mind when I say Bob Proctor. Salesman. <laughs> <laughs> that is perfect. Yeah, I think of myself as a salesman. Yeah. I'm always selling. I love selling. Selling is leading another person in a path of agreement. Mm -hmm. It's helping other people get what they want. Nothing would move if it weren't for salespeople. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed this video. We put a lot of good information up here and it causes everything in your life to get better. If you'd like us to notify you every time we put a new video up, hit subscribe and then turn on notifications. Check out all our videos and we will notify you when we put a new one up.